did. Hello, and thank you for joining us. Welcome to the 2022 American Diabetes Association Ask the Expert series. Today's topic is diabetes eye disease, what in the world is happening? My name is Carla Cox, registered dietitian and certified diabetes care and education specialist, and your host for today's program. Remember that our Ask the Experts series is all about answering questions from our listeners, so start getting your questions ready. For those of you on the phone, press star three, that's star three on your keypad and an operator will collect your question and place you in the queue so that you may have the opportunity to ask your question live. To participate online, type in your name and question it in the fields below the streaming player. Press the submit question button and your question will come directly to us. In addition, we invite you to provide us with your feedback in a survey when you leave the event. We will use the information to help us plan for future events. There are two options to participate in the survey. You may complete the survey online by going to tinyurl.com forward slash ATE003 into any web browser to complete the survey via your computer. Again, that is tinyurl.com forward slash ATE003. Or you can text the code at ATE0524 to the number 833-373-0403 to complete the survey on your mobile phone. Again, that is at ATE0524 to the number 833 373-0403 to complete the survey by text. If you are joining us on Facebook, YouTube, or listening to our podcast, please be sure to give us your feedback by completing the survey as well. Okay, now a little bit about why we're here today. The American Diabetes Association, together with Visionary Partners, VSP Vision Care, and Regeneron Pharmaceuticals, Incorporated is focusing on an often overlooked but costly and devastating complication of diabetes, vision loss. This eye health initiative, Focus on Diabetes, provides tools and resources for people with diabetes to learn how to reduce their risk of developing eye disease by managing glucose values and getting an annual comprehensive dilated eye exam, even if symptoms are not present. As part of the initiative, the ADA is holding this free educational Q&A. We'll cover information and tips to help you take charge of your health. And now I am delighted to introduce our guest for today's event, Dr. Cheryl Reynolds. Dr. Cheryl Reynolds received a Bachelor's of Science degree from the University of Florida and attended NSU College of Optometry, where she earned her Doctor of Optometry in 1996 and pursued a residency in primary care optometry. She recently rejoined the faculty at NSU College of Optometry after being there for nearly 20 years. Prior to returning, she was an optometric liaison for your eye specialist working alongside noted glaucoma, retina, and corneal specialists for about a year. She is a fellow in the American Academy of Optometry and the Optometric Retinal Society. She served as an investigator in numerous research studies and has published multiple publications on ocular disease. Apart from her passion in academia, Dr. Reynolds serves as the current president of the National Optometric Association. She was awarded the National Optometric Association Optometrist of the Year, which is a big deal, in 2013. And I think a very interesting list of her accomplishments is a medical mission to Jamaica. I have been there too on several medical missions, so we are bonded in that aspect. So something we share. As we are waiting for our callers and online listeners to chime in, I'm gonna go ahead and kick off with, with asking you if you could give us a brief introduction. So what does the landscape look like when it comes to diabetes, eye disease, both here and abroad? Well, first I wanna say thank you to the American Diabetes Association, to VSP and Regeneron, and to you, Ms. Cox, for having me on this program. Again, my name is Dr. Cheryl Reynolds, and I am an associate professor at Nova Southeast University College of Optometry, and I also run our retina clinic. And so what does the landscape look like for a diabetic eye disease or diabetes eye disease? What we know right now in 2022 is 
is that more and more people have diabetes. In fact, Carla, the recent National Diabetes Statistics Report that was just published in January of 2022 noted that now in the United States, over 37 million people currently have diabetes. And importantly for the audience to know is that 96 million people have prediabetes. These are those individuals that are on the road to developing diabetes without intervention. And if you add those numbers together, roughly 130 million Americans have diabetes and are currently at risk for developing diabetes. And what's really important is that the pandemic of 2020, the COVID pandemic, really shed a light on, uh, you know, where we are. And it's important to know that diabetes is also an epidemic. And in the last two years, when you look at those numbers, 11 million more people are, have been diagnosed with diabetes. There is one number, however, that I really want the audience to pay attention to, and that is roughly 8.5 million Americans are undiagnosed. That means they're walking around with diabetes but are unaware that they have the disease. And that's important to note because we as eye care practitioners, optometrists, ophthalmologists, all of us, really need to underscore the message, the important awareness and education to our patients, to everyone, that it's important to have a comprehensive eye exam because a comprehensive eye exam can detect changes in the back of the eye that the patient is unaware that they have uh, when it comes to diabetes. And you know, Carla, it's not just in the United States that we're seeing more and more people with diabetes, worldwide, the disease is also exploding. Currently, in, in globally, 537 million people have diabetes. That number is expected to increase by 2045 to 783 million people. And just like in the United States, a significant number of these individuals that have diabetes are unaware that they have the disease. One in two, or roughly 232 million people globally, are walking around with diabetes, but they're unaware that they have the disease. And when it comes to diabetes, eye disease, we know that diabetic retinopathy and diabetic macular changes or those clinical findings that are associated with, you know, bleeding in the back of the eye or swelling in the back of the eye from diabetes, it is the leading cause of vision loss or blindness in working age adults. And that are those individuals that are 20 to 74 young, right? Young individuals still at 74. And that's why it's so important that we get the message out about diabetes eye disease and making sure that our patient, the audience, everyone understand the importance of a comprehensive dilated eye exam as part of not only diagnosing diabetes, but also managing the disease, as well as preventing vision-threatening changes that can occur. Thank you so much. If you're just joining us, welcome to today's Ask the Experts Q&A, Diabetes Eye Disease, What in the World is Happening? As a reminder, for those of you on the phone, press star 3 on your keypad, and an operator will collect your question and place you in the queue so that you may have the opportunity to ask your questions live. To participate online, type in your name and question in the fields below the streaming player. Press the Submit Question button and your question will come directly to us. Thank you. Now let's take our first question. So we're going to Cheryl. Cheryl Ann. Cheryl, you are on the line. Cheryl Ann. Hey, if you've had diabetes for a long period of time and uh, your EC1s and your uh, blood sugars are high, and also your um, cholesterol levels. Um, can that be an issue with the eyes uh, as time goes on? And can your vision change from, you know, uh, being uh, where it's uh, it's higher in level with 
with um, bleeding, you know, with the diabetes uh, retinopathy or the bleeding in the eyes. Thank you, Sharon, for that question. So in answering that question, again, just to kind of recap what I said earlier, when we talk about diabetes eye disease, we know that diabetic retinopathy and diabetic macular changes um, are some of the leading causes of vision loss, and that is where the patients have bleeding in the back of the eye. One of the important risks for developing diabetic retinopathy and diabetic macular edema is duration. So yes, Sharon, the longer the patient has diabetes, the more likely they are to develop changes in the back of the eyes or diabetic retinopathy. And the other important question that you were asking, it's so important for us as eye care practitioners and as part of the healthcare team to talk to our patients about their glycemic control. We know that patients may not always do the glucometer testing where they look at their blood sugar level, but it's important to know their A1C levels, your hemoglobin A1C, which should be a number of seven or less. And what's important about the hemoglobin A1C, Sharon, is that for every one point reduction in your hemoglobin A1C, the better it is that you can reduce the risk of diabetic retinopathy in the eye. So going from seven, um, from eight to seven reduces retinopathy by up to 63% in some cases. But it's not just the eye disease, it's also the other complications, Sharon, that can occur in patients that have diabetes. So we know diabetic retinopathy is the leading cause of blindness, but patients with diabetes also are at risk for diabetic nephropathy or kidney disease. In fact, diabetes is the leading cause of end-stage kidney disease. And the other thing that's important and why it's important to get your A1C seven or less, and the American Diabetes Association recommends 6.5 uh, for better control, is that you can reduce your risk of diabetic nephropathy, the kidney disease, and also diabetic neuropathy, diabetic nerve pain, um, you know, having sores at the bottom of your feet. And what is also important in our patients with diabetes sharing that you brought up is comorbidities. Patients that have blood pressure and cholesterol in addition to having diabetes can also be at greater risk for developing changes in the back of the eyes. So that's why I would say the ABCs of diabetes, knowing your A1C level, also knowing your blood pressure level. I mean, right, currently right now it's recommended that patients that have diabetes have better blood pressure control. Uh, we also want our patients to have better cholesterol control because when these comorbidities aren't well controlled, they can lead to or worsen diabetic retinopathy, the bleeding in the back of the eyes, and it can also worsen that diabetic macula edema changes. And important to know when we're talking about diabetes eye disease that it's not just the retinopathy that is really critically important. It's also that patients with diabetes and patients with uncontrolled blood sugar levels are at risk, greater risk of developing cataracts. In fact, patients with diabetes are 60% more likely to develop, to develop cataracts, which can also impair their vision. And also, another potentially blinding disease can also occur, which is glaucoma. And patients with diabetes are 40% more likely to develop glaucoma, which can also rob the patients of their sight. So these are all of the reasons why it's important for our patients to get better uh, control of their diabetes. And the longer they have the disease, the more important it is that they have comprehensive eye exams every year to make sure that we can detect these changes early. The other important thing that I just want to leave uh, the audience with as well, your glycemic control, your A1C levels can also uh, uh, impact your vision. 
if your ele- if your blood sugar levels on your A1C are elevated, it can cause your vision to be blurry or cause changes in your prescription. So sometimes patients with diabetes tend to have a bag of, you know, I call it a bag of glasses as I teach my students. They have numerous pairs of glasses because, you know, doctors are uh, checking them and, you know, may not ask your glycemic control. So it's important to note if you find a change in your vision, if it's fluctuating, if it's changing, that can also indicate that your blood sugar level is not as well controlled as it should be. And these are all of the reasons that you should have better uh, glycemic control uh, for our patients that have diabetes. Um, And so, you know, it is important also, too, that your eye doctor uh, make sure that they send a note to your treating primary care physician, your endocrinologist. As you know, diabetes is a team approach, so that if we detect early changes in the eyes or any changes in the eyes, that might also impact maybe the level of care, maybe the medication might be changed, the patient might be put on newer medications. So, yes, Sharon, all those questions that you ask are so critically important, and I hope I've addressed them for you. Thank you. We now have a question coming in from Mary. Mary's from New York. Mary, could you you have a question? Yeah. Um, I have uh, diabetic retinopathy, and recently, just Friday, I found out that I have uh, some vein forming on my iris. Uh, I can't think of the word, what they called it, but um, I've never heard of this before. And I'm just um, I'm just trying to find out what is the best uh, way to go about getting this stuff treated. All right, thank you, Mary, for that question. Those are important questions. So, as we noted, uh, diabetic retinopathy and the bleeding in the back of the eye, the changes in the back of the eyes can occur, and it is the leading cause of vision loss or blindness in working age adults. So that bleeding, those changes in the back of the eye, really indicates that the back of the eye, which is called the retina, is not getting enough oxygen. And when a structure in the body or in the eye is not getting enough oxygen, new blood vessels, Mary, develop. And so the term is neovascularization. So in the back of the eye, when neovascularization occurs, the most uh, uh, current treatment is injection in the eye of a medication to help cause those blood vessels to regress. And also, too, if you have swelling in the macula, the retinal specialist might be injecting the eyes with a medication to minimize the swelling. In some patients, those new blood vessels can also occur on the iris, Mary. So it's neovascularization is the term of the iris. And what that indicates is that you may need to have more injection. So what's important is that you follow up with the retinal specialist that is treating you um, and that you are being managed by, and that that specialist may elect to inject the eye with this medication that will cause those new blood vessels to regress. What happens with these new blood vessels, Mary, is that they're weak and they're leaky. And in some patients, they can cause other problems. So when it's on the iris, it can cause a condition called neovascular glaucoma, which can lead to a painful eye situation. That's why it's important that you continue to follow up with the retinal specialist and that you continue to follow their recommended care. And part of the care would be that they may have to inject the eye, check the pressure in the eye, and manage you that way. But also what's important for you to do is... um, You know, if we could get better glycemic control, one of the things that it's important for me to educate my patients on is that, okay, we have diabetic retinopathy, but we can some ways maybe slow it down by better control of our uh, A1C levels. So it's important, Mary, if your A1C level, your blood sugar levels aren't as well controlled, there are steps that you could do. Diet and exercise um, may help 
in reducing or helping to reduce your glycemic levels in addition to the medication that your doctor recommends. But any of these recommendations, please talk to your doctor about other ways or um, important ways that you can help to lower your um, hemoglobin A1C levels or that you can improve your glycemic control. Thank you. We now have a question coming from Elizabeth. Elizabeth is from New York. Hello. Um, my question is, if you have had a bleed in your eye and as a result you have floaters in your vision, do those floaters eventually go away or are they there forever? Well, thank you for that question, Elizabeth. So two things. As um, as I was mentioning earlier, those new blood vessels in the back of the eye break and bleed. It would cause blood that will appear as floaters. So I always educate my patients with diabetes if they have new onset spots in their vision that's getting a little bit bigger or worsening to really see a optometrist, ophthalmologist for a dilated evaluation to assess and see if that is blood or bleeding in the eye. What can also occur is you can have a bleeding at one time and another bleed. So that's why it's important for my patients with diabetes to be seen, have a dilated exam anytime they're complaining about floaters and or flashes of light. Now, as our patients grow and become wiser in their years, right, older, then it's not uncommon for patients as they get older to have floaters in the eye. So if it's the normal age-appropriate floater, then yes, these floaters do, gravity pulls them down and they can get better and patients don't see them in their vision as much. But for my patients with diabetes, again, it could be just the normal age-appropriate floater, but it also can indicate blood that has occurred or a bleeding of a blood vessel. So that's why it's important for patients with diabetes to have new onset floaters or a recurrence of a floater that had gotten better that they are checked to make sure it's not new blood in the vitreous or a new bleed in the vitreous, um, which is the gel in the eye. So when I say the vitreous, if you think about the eye like a ball, there's a gel in the eye. It's called the vitreous. It's clear. And when you get older, there's changes in that vitreous. And what happens in patients with diabetes, because these new blood vessels, if they break or bleed, the blood goes into the vitreous. And that's why they see spots or large spots or have big spots in their vision um, that can impede their vision. So, again, you had a bleed, Elizabeth, and I would recommend that if this is a new onset floater, that you have it checked just to make sure that it is just a benign floater and it's not a new bleed. Thank you. We have a question. I think I think you just need to clarify this for people. Um, I hear this a lot. So this is coming in from Tabitha from Louisiana. Yes. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Uh, yes. I want to know: Is it necessary to get your eyes dilated in order to determine if um, if your eyes are okay? because I recently went through to the uh, ophthalmologist and had my eyes examined, but they, I guess, are using um, some new technology, and it seems that uh, you no longer have to, at least at that office, you no longer have to have your eyes dilated. But my, uh, but diabetes runs in my family as well. And if I'm not mistaken, my recent A1C was a 5.6, but I'm still in the pre-diabetes category. Can you give me some information on that? Okay. So let's talk about the first question, Tabitha. Do you have to have a yearly dilated eye exam? Um, I, you know, 
there are new technologies. Um, there's a new technology that allows us to take a picture of your eye, and we can see the back of your eye and see changes, and that's maybe what your ophthalmologist's office has. I do have that technology in my office as well, and I do utilize that for my patients that have diabetes. It gives me awesome information, plus I can utilize that to educate the patient. But sometimes it's important to see it as well and look in the back of the eye. So I'm a proponent, or I recommend a dilated comprehensive eye exam. Now, if your eye doctor has a camera and they're taking a look at the back of your eyes with a camera, you know, that's an adjunctive um, ancillary testing. So that is a question that's always asked. I don't have an absolute yes or no. What I do recommend, Tabitha, is that my patients that have diabetes or at risk of developing diabetes have a dilated retinal evaluation. And if they're not going to have the dilated retinal evaluation, I think it's important to capture the image with this new technology, follow the patient very closely. But it's also important for the doctor to take a look at the eyes so in addition to capturing the images, I think it's also important that um, the doctor takes a look at the back of the eye as well because there might be some changes that might not show up on the camera. Now, photos for retinopathy is important. We do telescreening. The American Diabetes recommend telescreening. For those where there's limited access to an eye doctor close by, um, you know, it can help us kind of sort of early detect changes and then refer the patient to the appropriate doctor. However, I'm a proponent of a dilated comprehensive eye exam as a way of, of making sure that we are not detecting any diabetic changes or di changes from diabetes in the eye. Now, when it comes to your other question about family history of diabetes and being a pre patient that has prediabetes, Again, 96 million people have prediabetes, and so it's important that you continue to follow up with the recommended care of lifestyle um, changes and diet modification to really control that because we know up to 30% of patients that have prediabetes or unknown diabetes, are, they have diabetes by the time they have an eye exam, and that's why it's important to have a comprehensive dilated eye exam in early detection. We can detect up to 30% of patients patients who are walking around not knowing that they have diabetes. So, yes, it's important for you to continue to follow what your doctor recommended for your prediabetes. Continue to follow closely and, and, and do your annual A1C testing or, you know, every three months or every six months A1C testing to make sure it's still prediabetes. And the best treatment for that is lifestyle changes, diet, and exercise to um, make sure that you control your prediabetes. And if there are changes in the back of the eyes, that's where we as eye care practitioners, was. it's so important that we communicate that to your treating doctor because you might still be uh, prediabetes, but now you have bleeding or it's mild hemorrhages or other changes in the back of the eyes that indicate diabetic retinopathy, and it may indicate that you need to be on treatment, that lifestyle and diet and exercises, <clears throat> they worked but they're no longer working as efficaciously as they did before. Great. So I, I think something we really need to clarify, um, and you're doing a good job of it, but I think why is it so important, even if their vision is great, um, but why is it so important that you as an optometrist find these problems early on? Can you do things that help preserve their vision? Yes. <clears throat> Thank you for that question. That is a great question. That's why we recommend a yearly comprehensive diabetic or, you know, dilated eye exam. So vision, you can be 20-20, which we consider normal good vision, and have diabetic retinopathy. You can be 20-20 and have diabetic macular edema. So although your vision is good, it doesn't indicate if there is or there is not diabetic changes in the back of your eyes. And the only way to detect diabetic-related changes in the back of the eyes is with a comprehensive dilated eye exam to detect whether it's the cataract changes, whether it's dry eye changes, dry eyes, not uncommon in our patients that have diabetes, ocular surface um, 
issues, dry eyes, you know, stinging and burning of the eyes, cataracts, glaucoma, and of course, diabetic retinopathy and diabetic maculopathy. And what's really important in preserving sight, the first step is early detection. If we can catch it early, we know that the patient can, um, you know, better management of their disease, that they can control the retinopathy better. For example, if I see one small hemorrhage in the back of the eye in the patient's uh, A1C 7.5, if that patient gets that A1C a little bit better, I've seen cases where that one hemorrhage has improved has gone away. Now, I've also seen patients where the hemorrhage can progress and get worse. That's why it's important to follow these patients. Additionally, if the patient has changes that might require invasive treatment, so, you know, as optometrists, we see our patients, we, we, we follow them very closely if they have changes, but when they have more bleeding, when they have the swelling in the macula area, or if they have these new blood vessels that I spoke about, these patients are referred by me to a retinal specialist, and we co-manage the case. Now, that retinal specialist will either treat with injections in the eye or a laser treatment. The earlier they could do the treatment, the better the prognostic outcome, the better we can preserve sight. So that's why it's important to do early detection. That's why it's important to do comprehensive yearly eye exam so that we can see these changes early. And more importantly, as I mentioned earlier, I think for me as an optometrist, a comprehensive yearly dilated exam can also detect if the patient has undiagnosed diabetes or as their pre-diabetes is now needing to be managed as a full-on diabetes with oral medication. So that's why it's important. Early intervention of treatment can preserve sight, and it can delay loss of vision and or blindness from diabetic retinopathy. Great, thank you. So we have a question coming in from Elizabeth. Elizabeth from Richmond, Virginia. Hello? Hi, Elizabeth. Hi. Uh, yes, I do have two questions. First of all, I'm a type 1 diabetic, and I have been for 44 years now. And I do have um, diabetic retinopathy and macular edema and some problems with um, the pressure in the eye that I'm using drops for. I've had um, much laser. I've had vitrectomies in both eyes, and I've been used. I've been being injected with um, drugs for many years. I guess about ten or fifteen years now. First, it was Lucentis, then uh, now it's Ilea. Now, my eye doctor has told me that um, there is a new drug that's being used for um, macular, I'm not uh, macular degeneration that um, they think may help um, with uh, diabetic macular edema. And I, I need to know what you think of that drug. I can't remember the name of it, and I probably couldn't pronounce it, but um, it hasn't been out very long, maybe six months or so. Mm-hmm. And my second question, um, I heard um, one of your experts talking before about high blood pressure affecting the eye. and um, I've had a lot of hemorrhages, of course, which led to the laser and the vitrectomies. And I have a problem with having blood pressure that varies a lot. Sometimes it will go really, really low. Like, uh, for an example, the other day it was 80 over 62. And I felt really bad. Sometimes it will be high. It will be like 180 over 90 And uh, if I'm in my doctor's office. So it's, it's very... Um, distressing because they don't really know exactly what to do to treat it. And um, I I don't want to take a blood pressure medication if you think it's not necessary or if it's not affecting my eyes at all. Sorry, it's such a long question. (laughs) That's okay, Elizabeth. All right, so for the first question, um, as a type 1 uh, patient with diabetes, you already know that uh, the longer you have the disease, the more likely you'll have retinopathy, right? That's one of the biggest risks duration, as I mentioned earlier. 
So our patients that have type 1 diabetes tend to have diabetic retinopathy at an earlier stage, you know, up to 10 years, 20 years of the disease. Um, you know, most patients with type 1 diabetes will have some level of retinopathy. So it's important that you are being followed by your retinal specialist and it's been treated over the years. And you mentioned a key thing that I wanted to just underscore again, and that is the glaucoma component and you're using drops. So again, in addition to the diabetic retinopathy, the other diabetes-related eye disease includes glaucoma, so I'm glad you're being treated for that. When it comes to the treatment for patients that have diabetic retinopathy, the most the latest treatment is, of course, injection in the eye. And you mentioned Lucentis. So these medications attack the um, new blood vessels and or the swelling and help to minimize the swelling and it helps to minimize or regress those new blood vessels. So you have Lucentis and now you have ILEA, which works a little bit differently than Lucentis. The latest and the newest injection in the eye is Babismo or it's a medication that is bispecific, it has dual properties. So it has the medication that's already in, in the Lucentis ilia, that's your antivascular endothelial growth factors or anti-VEGF medication, but it has this new uh, way of helping the vasculature in the eye. Um, so it's the angiopoietin. Um, component. So it's so new. I am working with a retinal specialist that has been doing it uh, for patients, have been injecting patients with this newer medication that is just recently approved. And the studies have found that one of the things with this newer medication is that it can sort of uh, uh, allow for a longer time between injection. So instead of monthly um, with Lucentis, like you have been doing, Elizabeth, ILEA is every two months because it's a different way of uh, way that medication works as far as injection. This newest one can go to four months. So that's the uh, ultimate uh, good news is that with this new medication, you can prolong the time between injection. But, you know, we're waiting for more data, of course. But um, I would definitely talk to your retinal specialist about this newer medication to see if you're a candidate to have that um, newer medication um, injected. But that how it, that's how it works. It utilizes the medication you're currently having, and it also has a newer component that helps to stabilize the blood vessels. So not only are we helping to regress new blood vessels and swelling, but we're also stabilizing um, the vasculature. Um, and, of course, I would definitely talk to your doctor. Again, I mentioned earlier that the ABCs of diabetes is what I like to call it, knowing your A1C, knowing your blood pressure and your cholesterol. And patients that have diabetes, one of the things that we know is that blood pressure that's not well controlled or cholesterol can exacerbate or make worse their diabetic retinopathy. I think it's important to talk to your doctor and to follow your doctor, your primary care physician, your endocrine chronologist recommendation when it comes to the blood pressure. I can't recommend if you take the medication or not, but also, too, I think at this point you may want to talk to your doctor about your kidney levels, your kidney function. That also, uh, your kidneys are important to not only your blood pressure regulation, but also to diabetes. Remember, diabetes is one of the leading causes of end-stage renal disease, and that might be another component as to why the blood pressure is fluctuating. All of these discussion points need to be had with your treating doctor, um, you know, just to make sure that if there's underlying um, a kidney disease in addition to retinopathy. So I recommend, Elizabeth, that you talk to your doctor about the blood pressure. Thank you. Rosalie writes in and says, can you speak about dry eye? Isn't over-tearing one of the signs and what is the best over-the-counter treatment? Yes, Rosalie. So dry eye is the latest uh, sort of, you know, there's been a lot of patients that suffer from dry eyes, so there's been a lot of focus recently when it comes to dry eyes. So there's, you're correct in that one of the symptomology of dry eyes is excess tearing. And just to give you uh, sort of why that happens is we have two tearing system, right? The first one it keeps our eyes moist. We don't even know it's working. When you're young, it's working. It's keeping your eyes moist. 
And then um, the other system is when you laugh and you cry, your eyes produce more tears. Well, as you grow up, age, that can affect that first system, but so can underlying diseases like diabetes and high blood pressure, sometimes side effects to medication, and that can cause that first system not to work so well, and so the second system kicks in trying to compensate, and that's why one of the symptomology of dry eye is excess tearing. So I want the audience to know if your eyes are tearing a lot, it's because you're your eyes are dry and is trying to compensate. There are over-the-counter drops that, um, you know, numerous ones on the counter. Um, you know, I don't have a favorite. I tend to have dry eyes myself because I'm growing up. Um, but, uh, you know, Refresh is a good brand. Genteel is a good brand. Sustain is a good brand. But what we're finding now is that you could treat dry eyes, especially in our patients with diabetes, with more than just over-the-counter drops. And so, um, you know, I would definitely uh, recommend that you talk to your doctor if the over-the-counter drops aren't working. You're not finding relief and or you're utilizing them more often than you should. Typically, you should use these over-the-counter drops one to two times a day, maybe three times at most. But if you're finding yourself putting drops in four times, five times, then they may not be working as efficaciously as you would like. And there are additional ways uh, to help with dry eyes. They have, you know, medications such as Restasis and Zydra and uh, Sequa. These are different medications that can help with dry eyes and help the patient feel a lot better. And I think you, you, it's important to be assessed to see if you're a candidate for that and talk to your eye doctor about maybe getting a prescription of those medications that can help with your dry eyes. Importantly also to, um, you know, ocular surface issues. So in addition to dry eyes, patients who have diabetes might have ocular surface issues. What do I mean by that? If you wake up and your eyes are a little crusty, you might have where the glands in and around the eyes aren't working properly and they may need to be expressed. Um, or massage, and so you have newer treatment for dry eyes that can look at those glands, open them up a little bit better so that the patients have less symptoms. So I would recommend that you talk to your doctor, your eye doctor, about your dry eye treatment because if those drops aren't working, it's more than just, you know, treating with typical over-the-counter. You may need to have something like uh, a restasis or something else for that. Thank you. We have a call coming in from Anthony. Anthony is from Midland, Michigan. Hello? Hi, Anthony. Yes, hi, uh, doctor. Listen, um, I've been insulin dependent for about 46 years now, and um, my, eye, my vision had been good up until about two or three years ago, and I start getting blurry vision in my right eye, okay? Uh, I then saw couple ophthalmologists locally, and uh, they said there was nothing that could be done to correct it. Uh, I went then to the University of Michigan Hospital, uh, a Kellogg Center, and Dr. Chobe down there uh, did an exam, and he told me it's due to a lack of blood flow to the optic disc. Now, I don't know if you have, if this can be reversed. I mean, I know I've seen three ophthalmologists already about this because I've got 2,200 vision in my right eye. And look, thank God my left eye still is fine. And, and I just hope it stays that way. It doesn't become like my right eye. But uh, uh, if there is any knowledge that you have that can correct this issue, Okay, very good question, Anthony. So when you have a lack of uh, blood flow to the optic nerve, so the optic nerve in your eyes it allows us to see our world, right? It's the nerve. And when your nerves aren't working properly, then you're either paralyzed or, you know, paralysis. So the nerve in the eye is really important. So if there's lack of blood flow to the nerve in the eye, unfortunately, it's irreversible damage. That means that nothing I can do, nothing anyone else can do can help um, um, 
cause those nerves to come back. Now, you may have had a condition where, you know, whether it's a non-arteritic ischemic optic neuropathy or something that caused that lack of perfusion to the optic nerve head. The most important thing is that it doesn't happen to your good eyes, you mentioned. So that's what's important to make sure that you're following up with, you know, the uh, follow-up care, maybe every three months, six months follow-up care with your ophthalmologist to really make sure nothing goes on with your other eye. But unfortunately, with the uh, right eye and the optic neuropathy that has occur, uh, occurred, there's nothing that I could recommend. Now, what I do recommend for patients that have decreased vision in one eye and, um, you know, moderate vision in the other eye, sometimes I I recommend low vision evaluation. There's no reason for our patients that have visual impairment to not have a low vision assessment. So what is a low vision assessment? A low vision assessment um, allows... um, you know, devices that can help with reading. It can help with magnifiers, illumination, you know, font sizes, the way you read. Just help our patients improve their quality of life by increasing the magnification. So if it's affecting you in that way, I would recommend a little vision assessment. But unfortunately, um, reperfusion of that nerve is very you know, unless it, you know, not knowing which uh, condition happened, it's very challenging, Anthony. So I don't have anything to recommend as far as um, reversing it. What I will say is that uh, the good news is that you are being followed and being monitored very closely with your treating ophthalmologist, and I would recommend that you continue with that. And also, too, if there is... Uh, changes in your vision as far as it impacts your reading, uh, your quality of life to have a low vision assessment to see if there's anything that we could do to improve the magnification in your um, right eye. Great. Thank you so much. So we have a couple questions in this category. So I'm going to ask Etna from Chicago to ask her question. Etna, are you on the line? Yes, I'm online. Okay, so my your question, question is, is uh, last week my husband woke up and he couldn't see, and so we went in and went to the emergency room, and then they sent him to the eye specialist. So he was diagnosed with having a, a mild stroke in his left eye. So his question is, will he ever recover his sight um, back in that eye? Thank you. And and that's what I was uh, um, at enough of that question, because that's what I was alluding to with the last caller, is when you have lack of perfusion, it could be a stroke in the eye, right? So not knowing what exactly per se happened, but when you have poor blood flow, um, lack of blood for uh, impairment of blood flow, it can lead to what we say is a stroke in the eye, and it can affect the nerve in the back of the eye, the retina in the back of the, you know, uh, back of the eye. And when, when you have a stroke in the back of the eye, depending on where it is, it may lead to permanent loss of vision. In some cases, just like you would have a stroke, um, and you might have a mild stroke, right? So a patient might have a mild stroke where it's important to act fast if you see, you know, drooping of the face, slurred speech. Um, the patient is complaining about tingling in their arm. We, we want to we want to act fast. The patient might be having a stroke. So a patient with a mild stroke may recover some um, neurological function. But when you have a significant stroke, um, that patient might be impaired. They might have paralysis, um, you know, and, and need to assist assistance. Same thing in the eye. You may have mild changes or mild blood vessels broken or uh, a branch retinal vein occlusion may occur or a branch retinal artery occlusion in the back of the eyes. You have arteries and vein. You might have occlusion in either one. And if you have it out in the periphery, it might cause subtle changes but not big changes. When you have it around the optic nerve head, depending on it, whether it's an artery it might, or vein, it might cause permanent uh, uh, loss of vision. So if he had a stroke and the vision is compromised, the vision may not come back. There are some cases where as reperfusion occurs, I have patients that go from 2200, um, as our previous caller said, his vision was to maybe 2100, 2080. 
So there might be some subtle improvement in the vision. But, um, I mean, he, this just happened to your husband. There might be mild, if any, improvement, but he won't go back to 2020 vision, more likely. And I think what's important for you, Edna, is what caused the stroke. Again, was did your uh, uh, does he have diabetes? This is one of the other complications. Now we talk about diabetic retinopathy, but you can also get a stroke in the eye from uncontrolled diabetes um, or poorly controlled diabetes. So that's important that you brought that up because that is a risk factor in our patients that have diabetes, having a stroke in the eye. Thank you. Um, also, when would you suggest that the person with type 2 diabetes, they just got diagnosed, how long should they wait before they have a dilated eye exam? Thank you for that question. That's really important. So remember I said 30% of patients at the time they're diagnosed have retinal changes. They may have early retinopathy or subtle retinopathy in the eye. And because that number is not low, it's still, to me, pretty significant. I recommend that any patient with type 2 diabetes and are, that recently got diagnosed or just diagnosed have a comprehensive dilated eye exam to make sure that there's no retinopathy. After that compre initial comprehensive dilated exam, if there's no retinal changes, there's no findings, then I recommend a yearly, you know, one to two year um, annual visit to make sure that there's no retinopathy, depending on how well the patient's glycemic control. You know, if a patient is doing well, they're taking their medication, they could do a year, a year and a half, two years. But um, I, I'm one of those eye doctors that recommend a yearly assessment. Um, and for patients that are just diagnosed, they need to have an eye exam immediately as well. Thank you. And, and does that change with type 1 diabetes? So if patients that have type 1 diabetes, um, you know, these patients are on insulin early. They need to be followed by our ophthalmologist every year as well. Uh, again, patients with type 1 diabetes have retinal, retinal, retinal changes earlier, you know, because they've had the disease, you know, at a younger age. So that's why it's important to see. I recommend every year. Um, you know, if your doctor says every one to two and you're really good and you're well controlled, uh, then, of course, your doctor's recommendation. The American Diabetes Association uh, recommends every one to two years, every, you know, if everything is good, every two years for patients uh, with type 2, you know, uh, every one to two years for patients with type 1. I do want to mention another type of diabetes. We talked about prediabetes, Carla, but I also want to mention for our pregnant patients or our the, those in the audience that had had pregnancies and they had gestational diabetes. What's important about gestational diabetes is that if you had that during your pregnancy, uh, up to 60% of patients develop type 2 diabetes five years after having the child. So patients that have gestational diabetes need to be monitored when they have the baby, you know, yearly, one to two years. During pregnancy, they should be seen before pregnancy, during their uh, first and second, third trimester, very closely observed uh, because their sugar levels can be fluctuating during a pregnancy or, you know, if they have better control. So I didn't mention that earlier, but I do want to mention gestational diabetes as well. Good. You know, I think you, you, you brought this up, which I think is great, is it used to be years ago that the recommendation was people with type 1 diabetes could wait five years to have their first uh, dilated eye exam. And I think that has really changed the standards of care, re recognizing that they can develop eye disease earlier than that. So it's more important to bring it up sooner. And that's even true of adolescents, I believe. Isn't that not, not right? And that is true, too. One of the things that we're seeing is uh, just um, a higher prevalence of diabetes in a younger adults, adolescents, teenagers. And there's the lesser, more known common uh, uh, causes of diabetes. It could be a latent onset diabetes, autoimmune di disease, where these patients are diagnosed as 18, 19. But one of the other risk factors for developing diabetes is obesity. You know, there's a term, uh, Carla, called diabetes when you put diabetes and obesity together. So it's important, um, you know, that young
young people also are checked very closely if they have prediabetes, if they have type they were diagnosed with type two diabetes and or they were diagnosed with these lesser rare forms such as latent um it's called a lot of latent onset diabetes. Um it's an autoimmune dysfunction and other um, you know, types of diabetes. You can also develop diabetes, I just want to mention, from medication. You know, one of the things with COVID-19 was treatment with oral steroids for patients that had breathing issues. Um, patients that take certain medication like oral steroids um, are at risk for hyperglycemia as well. So um, I just want to mention that um, in addition to. So definitely... If you're an adolescent, younger adult, obesity, as I said before, or on various medications that might impact your um, glycemic control, I would recommend that you at least have a comprehensive eye exam. And if there's no retinopathy, we can see you in two years. We can, you know, extend it out a little bit more. Thank you. So this wraps up our last question. Um, Cheryl, you've been awesome. So could you give us three quick kind of take-home messages from today? So the three quick messages are the ABCs of diabetes. And, uh, you know, the S at the end is important. So remember uh, we talked about your glycemic control, um, making sure that your A1C values are 7 or less. You know, 6.5 is what the American Diabetes Association recommend. Know your A1C, ladies and gentlemen in the audience. When you go see your eye doctors, they should be asking, what is your A1C value? And, um, you know, it should be 7 or less. Know that your blood pressure and that your cholesterol can impact your eyes and impact your, um, you know, your diabetes, and it can cause you to have earlier onset diabetic retinopathy. It can cause you to have um, um, worsening of your diabetic retinopathy. So it's important to get your blood pressure and your cholesterol under control. And last but not least is the S, smoking. We know that various studies have shown that smoking can exacerbate or make worse vascular conditions such as diabetes. So I think it's important um, to touch on smoking cessation for patients that have diabetes as well. And know that diabetes not only affects the eyes, it can affect all parts of the body. I tell my students it's from the top of your head to the bottom of your feet. Um, so it's the retinopathy, it's the nephropathy, kidney disease, your neuropathy, but also to diabetes can have caused heart disease, you know, cardiovascular disease, and other uh, changes in the body. And last but not least, I want to just recommend that in addition to having a yearly comprehensive dilated eye exam, which is the best way to detect early any changes and prevent worsening of the condition and to make sure that you're referred appropriately to um, a retinal specialist, is that whoever your eye doctor is, is communicating with your uh, healthcare team. Diabetes is a uh, multidisciplinary uh, disease. You need all aspects of the diabetic healthcare team to be involved. That includes not only the optometrist, the ophthalmologist, the eye care practitioners, but that includes your families. Families are very important. I've heard many times about, you know, my husband, my wife, you know, uh, it's important to make sure the family is involved. It's, ma it's important to make sure that, um, you know, mental health, you know, May's Mental Health Awareness Month as well as National um, um, Vision Month. And mental health is really important in our patients that have diabetes, um, especially with these challenges that are going on uh, with the pandemic. And, um, you know, one of the things that we know with diabetes is that causes cognitive decline. So mental health is important. Registered dietitian and nutritionists are really critically important. Pharmacists, you know, podiatrists, dental. You know, we know that um, diabetes can lead to dental disease, uh, periodontal disease, and gingivitis. So our dentists are very important. Social workers and case management, exercise physiologists are important to the team as well. Nurses, diabetic educators are really important uh, to the team as well. So we should be communicating with all aspects of the diabetes healthcare team to make sure that we can ensure the best outcome for our patients that have diabetes. Great. And for more information on eye health, you can visit eyehealth.diabetes.org. To help you feel confident about your ability to prevent and treat diabetes-related eye disease, we encourage you and your loved ones to talk to your healthcare provider about your risk, 
schedule an annual dilated eye exam, whether you have symptoms or not, and register for the next event at diabetes.org forward slash experts. We're sorry we were unable to get all to, your, to all of your questions during this Q&A event. If you have questions about this event, you are welcome to contact us at askada at diabetes.org or by calling 1-800-DIABETES, which is 1-800-342-2383. We're here to help you with your diabetes journey. Special thanks to our expert, Dr. Cheryl Reynolds. I am Carla Cox, and on behalf of the ADA team, we want to thank you for joining us today, and we look forward to connecting with our next Ask the Experts events. Focus on Diabetes will be September 27, Ethnic Differences, Does Race Matter in Diabetes Eye Disease? And I'm delighted that I believe Dr. Reynolds will be joining us again. No Diabetes by Heart, June 14, is partnering with clinicians, conversations to have with your healthcare providers. In addition, we invite you to provide us with your feedback in our survey. There are two options to participate in the survey. You may complete the survey online by going to tinyurl.com forward slash ATE003 into any web browser to complete the survey via your computer. Again, that is tinyurl.com forward slash ATE003 or text the code at ATE0524 to the number 833-373 0403 to complete the survey on your mobile phone. Again, that is at ATE0524 to the number 833-373-0403 to complete the survey by text message. If you are joining us on Facebook, YouTube, or listening to our podcast, please be sure to give us your feedback by completing the survey as well. Thank you so much for joining us, and we look forward to talking with you on the next Ask the Expert.